Yo, what's going on guys? Havoc here and I'm back. Today we're at it again with 17 more things only Clash of Clans OGs may remember. A series full of old Clash nostalgia and things that you just had to be there to fully understand. And hey, if you enjoyed today's episode, there are eight others just like this one that I'll leave linked down below and it'll be in the end screen as well. Anyways, let's get to it. Let's do this. Okay, I thought I was crazy for a second when I remember that at one point you couldn't move a certain obstacle that you cannot today. The loot car. <laughs> The loot cart had already been a thing long before the shovel, but the shovel introduced some interesting interactions like what can be moved or not. And originally you could not move the loot cart, but in the summer of 2019 that changed and you could finally move it. Why you may ask? I'm not entirely sure, but I believe it's because some players like to keep their loot cart around until it's at max capacity. You know, you don't want to claim it prematurely. Sometimes, I don't know, I collect it all the time. But because the loot cart could spawn anywhere in the village back then, having it in one spot for days or weeks could be a problem when trying to redesign your base. So for about half of the year of 2019, you could freely move the loot car wherever you wanted, but eventually they gave it its own area where it still spawns today, which eliminates the need to have to move it. This next one was a pretty long time ago, so grab your walker and tea for this one. But first, does anyone remember how useless buildings became when you upgraded or used them? Like for example, upgrading your spell factory, you couldn't make any spells, or your barracks, they became just buildings that you couldn't use. Well, does anyone remember how useless the laboratory would be? When you started an upgrade, it would kinda just lock you out of it for however long the upgrade was. You better take a damn screenshot because for the next few days or weeks, you're not gonna be able to see squat. Fortunately, in early 2013, you could finally browse the lab during an upgrade. <laughs> Revolutionary, right? We get excited for these simplest things back then. It makes me think how good we have it nowadays. You can upgrade just about any army building and still have access to it and even use it. The thought of that back then would have been crazy. Nowadays, finding a base with over a million of each resource is easy to find if you're in the correct league. Some people are out here finding two million of each. <laughs> But I remember playing years ago, and uh, let me tell you, the loot we're able to find nowadays is crazy. Finding 500k of each in 2014, you were like, ha diggity damn, what in tarnation? How the hell is that possible? I must be the luckiest player in the world. It's pretty funny looking back at it now, but of course, we didn't have upgrades costing 20 million or something gold, so it makes sense. Okay, this next one is gonna sound really dumb, but if you've been playing for a while, it might unlock some core memories for you. <laughs> Remember losing your builders? As if you were looking for Waldo in the crowd? <laughs> Yeah, it used to kind of annoy me, like where the hell is my builder? What building did I assign him to? I don't really remember. Sometimes it wasn't immediately obvious, and this was due to the lack of the builder summary screen. It just wasn't there. All that was there was an icon of the builder looking back at you, how many builders are being used, and a button that took you to buy more builders. That was it, and it was actually like this for a really long time. In March 2016, they added the builder summary feature, and ever since, it's been improving, and man, it's so convenient. You know, speaking of, builder suggestions didn't exist either. Do you remember how annoying it was to track how far you were into your progress? You had to look at every building individually, but the most annoying thing was never knowing what the max was for something that had multiple levels. Like, heroes. How the hell was I supposed to know level 40 is the max for Town Hall 10, you know? You just kept upgrading it until you couldn't anymore. That's how you found out. Or alternatively, you can go to Google and search it up. This is actually how progress spaces became a thing because it was such a convenient method of looking at all of your levels much faster and easier, laid out right in front of you in a neat and tidy order. In May 2016, we finally got the builder suggestions, which quickly solved all of those issues, but it wouldn't be until early 2019 where you could see all of your available upgrades, even if you didn't have enough loot for it. Pretty small one here, but surely some remember that some traps originally cost Dark Elixir. 
When these two new air traps were added, the air bomb and the seeking air mine, one was red and one was black. And this was during a time when Dark Elixir was a new resource, so it was pretty dang obvious that the seeking air mine was the much more powerful and Dark Elixir version of the air bomb. And so it was speculated that we would be getting more Dark Elixir traps as time went on. In the shop, you had to buy these with Dark Elixir, and as you may recall from a previous episode, you had to buy them every time they were set off so this was like a premium trap that you set in your base whenever you had the dark elixir for it however as the years went on traps became more commonplace in the game supercell wanted people to actually use them and not dependent on when they can afford it and so with the new rearm feature it was decided to make them all cost gold as it didn't make sense to have one trap cost dark elixir and the rest of them cost gold but yeah, I still remember this trap costing Dark Elixir. The concept of Dark Elixir traps was cool, but it never really took off. Nowadays, it's pretty hard to get online and not be noticed. I mean, the clan can see you attack, your friends know you're online, and there's even an indicator above the chat showing how many people are online. So if the clan is active, you know it is. But surely some of you remember of a time when you could get online and there was absolutely no way for anyone to tell that you were online. You could be farming for 8 hours straight and no one would have a clue. In fact, all 50 members in the clan could have been active at the exact same time and no one would have noticed because there was no way to tell. The only way to let your presence be known was to say something in the chat or sometimes you could visit someone and see if their barracks were training. Just go full stalker mode, I guess. But it was never really concrete proof that someone was on. The point is, lurking was possible, but today, not so much. There are various ways to tell if someone is online, which is the reason some have been asking the developers for a way to appear offline. Can you believe it's already been five years since the first skin was introduced? I mean, goddamn, where is time going? Something I remember from those times was just how different the first version of the skin selection screen was. The first version of this UI was basically the skin situated on a brick or stone floor. I don't know. The background was a flag, but as you can see, there weren't many details it showed either. All you saw was the skin name. For its time, it was enough, but as more skins were added, it felt like you needed to scroll forever and it quickly became outdated. About a year later, it was changed to this, where you simply tap the skin you wanted to view, and recently we got another refresh, which looks even better. And man, it's come a long way. War ties, or draws, whatever you want to call it. The fact is, I don't think any clan likes to get a draw. I mean, the rewards aren't the same and it isn't a win, right? Well, thank God it's 2024 and not before 2016 because war ties were way more common and man were they annoying. The reason they were more common is pretty simple. There was no tiebreaker system in place yet. If both clans got the same amount of stars, it was a tie. There was no process after that that accounted for any more variables. A tie was a tie. But yeah, that's basically it. There's not much to it. A war tiebreaker was implemented in September 2015, which looked at the total destruction from both clans. And to my knowledge, that's still how it works today. Nowadays, boosting just about anything will be one hour. Whether it's four times faster, 10 times, 24, the boost itself will last one hour. Of course, with the exception of resource collectors, they they have their own thing going. This makes it really convenient to remember what these potions do, and it also keeps everything consistent, which is actually great. However, and you may have already figured, it hasn't always been like this. Before magic items were a thing, the only way to boost buildings was to click on the building and boost it with gems. But the amount of time always seemed to vary. For example, at one point you could boost the spell factory for 4 hours. This was back when spells took an eternity to brew, so it made sense. The barracks and heroes had options for 2 hours, then at some point, 45 minute options. Eventually, as troops, spells, and hero training time got on par with each other, so did the gem boost options, and by the time magic items came out, 1 hour was like the standard, acceptable time for a boost. 
Ha ah, yes, the skeleton spell. It's been called the most useless spell throughout the years, and uh, that's the internet's opinion, not mine. But as you may have noticed, it doesn't exactly spawn regular skeletons. It's more like those guards similar to the graveyard spell in the clan capital, and guards from Clash Royale, which is where the design originated from. But back when it was released in 2016, it did spawn regular skeletons, which was the point of the spell. <laughs> but yeah, that's about it. I mean, it's easy to forget the spell was entirely different at one point, especially when it seems like it's not the most popular spell, especially back in the day. I'm surprised they didn't change the name to like Garth Spell or something. The old lightning spell. I'm sure you remember it used to require two housing space and it hit more than one place, but does anyone remember learning the pattern of where it hit? Honestly, I never cared enough to sit there and learn, but it was a thing. It definitely was. If you wanted to master the lightning spell, it felt like you had to take a crash course on where exactly it hit, why, when, what it can't hit, all that fun stuff. Honestly though, I prefer today's lightning spells for that exact reason. If you've been to Legends League before, you may know that if someone attacks you and gets zero stars, you win zero trophies. And in Legends League, that's actually better than losing anything. So losing zero trophies actually feels amazing. However, if you were in Legends League in 2019, you may recall that this was a little different. You could still lose trophies for successfully defending an attack. This is because the amount of trophies you win and lose in Legends League are based on the percent of the attack but it also applied even at zero stars. Fortunately for players in that league at the time, they ended up changing this before 2019 wrapped up. And I think it's one of the best things that they ever did to Legends League after the rework that went completely under the radar for most people. Nowadays, it's pretty easy to three star a Town Hall 10 and 11. It's almost a joke. But obviously when these were the max Town Halls, that wasn't the case. And it's not because new troops and spells, it's because the Inferno Tower was a whole different breed. <laughs> Back in 2013, the Inferno Tower was given a massive buff that allowed it to negate all healing effects on troops that it was targeting. So basically, whatever it targeted, those troops could not heal. This single-handedly made those Telhos way harder to attack. The Inferno was simply too powerful and over the years with new levels, it was getting out of hand. Supercell didn't like the idea of these Town Halls being too difficult to 3 star, so they completely removed that ability in December 2017. <laughs> Boy were the memes hilarious. They tried to buff it over the years, but it never came close to how powerful it was in those days. It's not often when a troop gets its housing space changed, and when it does, it can drastically change some strategies. Some may not care, but I found it very interesting to look at some troops and it reminded me of some good times and bad i guess <laughs> like the wall breaker went from one to two but also got smarter that was a w the hog from six to five you may remember that from the time it became way too op the miner from five to six and the boulder probably had the most dramatic one from eight to six there's probably a few i missed but those are the most notable ones Clan War Leagues are fun, and my clan rarely has a problem getting 30 people to participate. Sometimes we do 15, but it's good to have the option, right? Well, remember when Clan War League first came out? It sucked for big clans. <laughs> the only option you had was 15v15, which to be honest, never really made a whole lot of sense right out the gate. If all 50 members in your clan were trying to get some of those sweet ass new hammers that had just dropped, you'd have to rotate 15 members three times throughout the week and still have five members unaccounted for. It was simply too small of a roster for big clans. I'm so glad we have the 30v30 option nowadays. Switching between siege machines, clan castles, and the warden's mode during an attack is so convenient. I mean, I feel like I'm never ready, so it comes in clutch when I start an attack without thinking and I can still change stuff, you know? But once upon a time, that's not how it worked and many of you may remember. When the Grand Warden came out, you had to change it at the village and it remained this way for a very long time. It wouldn't be until Siege Machines was added where you could change those before dropping a troop. And then by the end of 2018, you could finally change both the Warden and Siege Machines at any point before deploying them. It may not seem like a big deal, but it has saved me so many times. So guys, that wraps it up for this episode. I can't believe soon enough this series turns three years old. Like, goddamn. 
It does not feel that long ago. Soon enough, episode one will be something only OGs remember. <laughs> but yeah, with that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. Please like, comment, and subscribe. And as always, have a gaming out. Peace.